All right, today we begin a new book of the Bible, and that is 1 John. So today we begin in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, a very important book for this reason. Its purpose is to help us discern whether we are truly Christians or not. And many people are deceived, and I know that because Jesus himself has said that many people will be shocked on Judgment Day. They thought they were Christians. They thought they were saved. They will be shocked when Jesus sends them to hell. And so that is the purpose of this book, to give us discernment, to help us to be able to judge whether or not we are truly saved, truly Christians. Father, we ask your blessings on this book and specifically on the verses we will be looking at today. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. The reality of God was not a matter of faith for John. He experienced God with his senses. He knew that God was real and he knew that Jesus was God. He saw him. He saw him. He heard him. He touched him. He lived with him. Talking about the God who in the beginning created heaven and earth. He lived with God in the flesh for three solid years. He looked into the eyes of God. He observed God. Every time Jesus opened up his mouth and spoke, he heard the word of God right from God's own mouth. And so it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Notice, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life. Christians have eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. There is no life of any kind for anyone without Jesus. Jesus is the fountain of life. Without a fountain of water, you don't get water. Without Jesus, you don't get life. Because there's no fountain. Without Jesus, our bodies crumble and our souls burn in hell. But actually, without Jesus, there is no physical body to crumble and there's no spiritual life at all. He is the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life, he said of himself. He created the physical life that we have and he grants us the eternal life that we have. Three. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Notice, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. He talked about Jesus, because he knew Jesus. And Jesus was real to him. And those who never talk about Christ are not experiencing him. They can't be. You don't talk about Christ. You, you haven't experienced him. They don't know him. They only know about him. You say, how can you be so sure? Well, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But in addition to that, I say that because if one truly keeps company with Almighty God, 
Now think about that. They're going to talk about him. How can you not talk about him? He's real to them. He's important to them. And people talk about the things that are real and important to them. They just do. If you like gardening, it's important to you, you're going to talk about gardening. If you like football, you're going to talk about football because it's important to you. And it's the same with God. People talk about the things that are real to them and important to them. John said, that which we have seen and heard, we declare. In other words, I'm going to talk about the God that I know. I'm going to talk about the God that I have a relationship with. And so will we. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Every Christian runs low on joy at times. The cares of this world choke out the Word of God, choke out our joy from time to time. When that happens, we need to go to the filling station, which is the Bible. We need a refill from the Word of God. The joy of the Lord is our strength. John is saying, I'm going to tell you about Jesus so that your joy may be full. See, so how does that work? Well, when a real Christian thinks about Jesus or is taught about Jesus, they become joyful. And that's because he is real to them. He is their Savior and he is their hope. Happy Christians are Christians who have a steady diet of God's Word and a steady diet of worship. Five. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light with no darkness at all. Meaning God is holy without any moral flaws. He is perfect in wisdom, perfect in knowledge, without even the slightest sin. God is light. So, whenever anyone gets upset with God, I know there is something wrong with their figuring. Because there's nothing wrong with God. God is light. He is our source of holiness, wisdom, joy, and anything else that is positive. Because all he is, is positive. Six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Do not say my relationship with God is fine and we enjoy each other's fellowship if you are living in sin without confessing or repenting because it just isn't true and it reflects badly on Jesus. Again, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. God is perfect in holiness, meaning he never does anything wrong, and he doesn't tolerate wrong in anyone else who he fellowships with. That's why Anyone who sins without repenting and without confessing and says that they are getting along with God is a liar. You sin, you don't confess, you don't repent, and you say you're getting along with God just fine, you're a liar. That's what God is saying here. And that message needs to be declared loud and clear. They are lying. And I say that because when an impenitent sinner says, God and I enjoy fellowship together, it suggests that 
God is okay with sin, and he is not. It reflects badly on God to say such things. It is a lie, and it is even blasphemous. 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sins. This is a wonderful verse. You know, if we Christians had to confess every single sin that we ever commit in order to be forgiven, we wouldn't have time for anything else. And we would be in trouble because we're not even aware of all the sins that we commit. You say, well, then if I'm not aware of them, then they're not really sins. Oh, yes, they are. I had a man tell me this uh, a couple of years ago, pastor. He said, well... He said, uh, I'm completely sinless because, because, uh, I said, you never do anything wrong? Well, yeah, but I'm, I, but I'm not, I don't do it on purpose so it doesn't count. Well, that's not what God's word teaches. God clearly teaches in his word that there are sins that are willful sins and there are also sins of ignorance. In fact, all those Old Testament offerings were given for sins of ignorance. They're still sins. No one, no one sins must be confessed in order to restore our fellowship with God. But sins of ignorance are automatically taken care of by the blood of Christ if we are saved. The blood of Jesus automatically cleanses us as we go along through life. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And this is talking about the sin nature. Anyone who says, I don't have a sin nature, nothing like that is a part of my life. God says, they are deceiving themselves. They are deceiving themselves, and I'm betting they're not deceiving anyone else, at least no one who has to be around them very long. And I say that because it's real easy to see sin in others. It's real easy to see the flaws in others. And certainly God sees them. So the one who says, I don't sin, is living in the land of make-believe, and he's all by himself. Nobody else is buying it. Verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sin. We are to confess our sins to God. Don't worry so much about other people's faults. Worry about your own. The primary focus should be on our sins. And I'll tell you something. The more we focus on keeping our house in order, the less we will notice the disorderliness in other people's houses. We are to confess our sins to God. Something else that it says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He is faithful and just. When God forgives a Christian's sin, he is being just. When we sin, he doesn't just say, ah, oh, forget it. It's no big deal. I'll just overlook it. Forget it. Forget about it. It's, it's nothing to worry about. God doesn't overlook anything. He sure doesn't overlook our sin. He forgives because Jesus was punished on our behalf. The penalty has been paid for, and that's how God can forgive without violating his sense of justice. Overlook it? No. He punished his son for it. That's how he can forgive us. He is faithful and just to forgive us. And, it says, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you realize that, that no matter how serious your sin may be, do you realize that confession wipes you clean? 
you are clean in Christ. When you confess a sin, God doesn't see it anymore because it is gone. It is literally gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us when we confess them. You shouldn't think about your sin again because God doesn't think about it again. He really doesn't. God never says, well, now, I know you confessed your sin, but I've got to tell you that I'm having a real hard time forgetting that one. He never, he never says that. He doesn't even think in those terms. It is gone for good, so don't bring it up to God again, and don't think about it anymore yourself. If you bring your confessed sin up to God, he's just going to look at you cockeyed, and he's going to say, what are you talking about? What sin? Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. God says, all have sinned. If someone says, I'm not a sinner, God says, you're calling me a liar, because I say you do. Don't tell me you don't sin when I say that you do. And don't try to get around it by redefining sin, which is done an awful lot today. The only way anyone can claim sinless perfection for themselves is to lower the standard or deny reality. People can be sinless. All they have to do is rename sin a dysfunction or a behavior disorder or simply say, I didn't mean it, so it doesn't count. You know, and that that sort of thing works real, real good. It works real well until Judgment Day, when plain make-believe will no longer be an option. Verse 11. Actually, chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. Stop there. Notice that one of the reasons God gave us his word is to keep us from sinning. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The more of the Bible we put into us, the less interested we will be in committing sin. And that's because the closer we are to God, the less we want to sin. The more we read the Bible, the better we will understand God and the closer we will be to God and the closer we are to God, the more we enjoy his fellowship and the less attractive sin becomes. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When a Christian sins, Jesus defends them. Whenever you and I sin, Jesus comes to our defense. We do not deserve his help, but that doesn't matter. He still reminds the Father that his perfect righteousness has been credited to our account. Jesus says, They may be unrighteous, Father, but I am righteous for them, and they are righteous in me, and they are forgiven. Verse 2, And he is the propitiation that would be the satisfaction for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world some people believe in a partial atonement that Jesus's blood only paid was only sufficient to pay for the sins of those who will actually be saved I, I don't believe that because of what this verse says the blood of Christ meaning the death of Christ on the cross paid for the sins of the whole world, meaning this, it was powerful enough to do the job for everyone. If someone doesn't enjoy the benefits of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, then it is their fault, because there wasn't anything lacking in his blood. If I'm late for something, 
because I drove 10 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone, then it is my fault. I didn't take advantage of the resource at my disposal, and that's why I failed. If people go to hell, it's not because the death of Christ wasn't enough. It's because they didn't take advantage of what God was offering them through Christ. Anyone who says, I can't believe that a loving God would send anyone to hell, doesn't understand that it's not his fault. If someone buys you a Big Mac and a Coke, unwraps it for you, puts it in your hands, don't blame him if you starve to death. God is offering Jesus to everyone, so anyone who goes to hell has no one to blame but themselves. Three. And by this we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments... Do not look for the assurance of your salvation in the fact that you were baptized or you prayed the sinner's prayer or you were confirmed. And please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that I'm against those things because I'm not and they're not even the issue. A hatred for sin a desire to please God and confession when we fail, those are the things that should give us the assurance of our salvation. The Bible teaches that holiness, not ritual, indicates salvation. 4. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Someone says, Jesus is my Savior. But he's not my Lord. You ever hear that one? Well, that's very popular. And some evangelical circles say, Jesus is my Savior. I know I'm going to heaven, but I don't obey him. And I don't live for him. He's not my Lord. It's really not unusual to hear that today. But it's not a true statement. It's impossible. And the modern day evangelical theologians who came up with that screwy doctrine will end up being responsible for the damnation of many souls. They have, they have people believing that you can make Jesus Christ your Savior and escape hell without Him being the Lord of your life. God says they're lying. If Jesus isn't someone's Lord and Savior, then He is neither their Lord nor Savior. And so it says in verse 4, very clear, he that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a what? A liar? Jesus is my Savior, but I don't obey him. I'm saved. You're a liar. Anybody who's told you that that's true is lying. And the truth is not in him. Five, but whoever keeps his word in him verily is the love of God perfected by this know we that we are in him a person should never feel secure about their salvation unless obedience to God characterizes their life and I'm not talking about sinless perfection although that's the goal which we should have but I'm talking about the general direction of our life being holiness and I'm talking about feeling terrible when we fail God those are indications that we are saved. Again, verse 6. He that, he that saith, he abides in him, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. In other words, the faith that saves is a faith that also makes a person holy. It's a package deal. The faith that saves us is a faith that that makes us like Jesus. The Bible says this, the grace of God that has appeared to us through Jesus Christ teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So the grace of God that brings salvation, that same grace also teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Again, it's a package deal. If you don't have one, you don't have the other. 
Jesus was devoted to God and compassionate towards people. If that's not the direction of a person's life, then their claim to be in Christ rings hollow. 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. The commandment to be devoted to God and kind to our fellow man has been with us since the beginning of creation. It's built right into us from birth. We inherently understand that it is wrong to treat others in a way that we would not like to be treated ourselves. No one can say, well, I didn't know I was supposed to treat others the way I wanted to be treated. Nobody can say that because it's built right into us. That's the old command. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. The basic command is old, but Jesus shed new light on the extent of it. For example, he said, you know the commandment, you shall not kill? I say unto you, don't even hate anyone. See, if you hate someone, you've murdered them in your heart as far as God is concerned. A Christian, a real Christian, will want to obey the letter of the law, but they will also want to obey the spirit of the law, as Jesus did. 9. He that says that he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness even until now. In other words, anyone who hates a Christian or wants to do evil to a Christian is out of touch with Jesus. Now, if you say you are walking with Jesus, but you hate your fellow Christian, then you're not walking with Jesus. Now, there may be things that you don't like about other people, but it doesn't result in hatred. If anything, we see it as an opportunity to exercise patience and grow in our walk with the Lord, but it's not hatred. Clearly, if someone hates a Christian, then they're obviously not walking with the Lord. Because he certainly wouldn't feel that way. Verse 10. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. Living in the light means to be in fellowship with Jesus Christ. The person who is in fellowship with Jesus will have the love of God in them, and that will keep them from wanting to hurt someone else. And that love will also keep them from holding a grudge against anyone who has hurt them. 11. But he that hates his brothers in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because darkness has blinded his eyes. A professing Christian who hates others, especially another Christian, is a professing Christian only. They either never have had a real relationship with God or they lost what they had. They are in darkness. They are not in sync with God. Their lack of wisdom and common decency gives them away, and the darkness they walk in is going to cause all sorts of trouble. Again, verse 11, But he, that's, he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He doesn't know where he's going. Because the darkness blinds his eyes. One time I was driving on a highway in Texas. And it was early in the morning. During a terrible storm. Worst storm by far that I have ever driven in. I couldn't see a thing out of the side windows. Out of the rear window. Or out of the windshield. Windshield wipers are going full blast. Nothing. It was like staring at a painted wall going down the highway, and it came on fast. And, you know, what do you do in a situation like that? You can't pull over in a situation like that because you don't know where the, you don't know where the shoulder of the road is. You don't know where the ditch is. For that matter, you don't, you don't even know where straight ahead is anymore. You just don't. And you can't slow down too much because you don't know if there's somebody right behind you that's going to plow into you. It's a, it's a bad situation to be in. It's dangerous to be blind. 
and consequently not know where you're going. There's, but there's only one thing worse than not knowing where you're going, and that is to not know where you are going, but to think that you do. And many hell-bound sinners think that they are heaven-bound saints because they have established a criteria of their own, which just adds to their self-deception. God gives us a test right here in this book. Verse 11, if you hate Christians, you're in darkness. If obedience doesn't characterize your life, you're in darkness. 